lot's changed, I feel like, since, you know, since it's come out and since the first season and stuff, because actually people know now. And as much as I wasn't trying to hide it, it's been kind of weird because I didn't realize it was weird. <laughs> well, when you say things have changed, do you mean people treat you differently now that they know you have an illustrious past that you were weirdly hiding for so long? I mean, I'm sorry to say weirdly. It's not, I'm sure you had your reasons. <laughs> It was, okay, but just, yeah, tell me, how how has your life changed? It feels like things have been unleashed, you know? Like, I feel really open to talk with people, whereas before it was just sort of a weird tick that I kind of had throughout my life of working with bands and, like, you know, going to help Guar go stitch up their costumes and then, you know, getting to Europe and recording with the Rolling Stones and then uh, had dinner with Buckethead and then... Things like that. And then I just thought that was like a normal... Well, okay, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but a weird tip. Never mind. You have... Listen, you <laughs> conducted your life the way you conducted your life. And I'm just glad that you've let me in on this secret. Uh, whatever your reasons for keeping this a weird secret, I, I, I appreciate that it's out in the open now and that, and that you've, you've brought me with you on this journey. You're listening to a conversation between Scott Jacobson, a lover of In Memoriams, and Tamara Federici, producer of every band ever, already in progress. There have been a lot of high profile uh, deaths lately of, of musicians, uh, people who are beloved, you know, people who I love. There's, you know, Burt Bacharach died recently. He's, uh, he was 94 years old. It's not, not a shock. David Crosby, also an elderly man who lived a life of, um, you know, pushing the limits of his body. It's not a shock that he would pass away at uh at any age, it wouldn't have been a shock several decades ago. But then there's, um, you know, there's ones that hit harder for me. Like there's a uh, Trugoy the Dove from De La Soul, and uh, Tom Verlaine, who was, you know, he was a, a distinguished older man, but he's he wasn't elderly. So I just wanted to discuss some of of these guys and just first of all, I, d- have you worked with any of them? I mean, of course, I, Scott, I worked with all of them. Wow. Then I have a lot of questions. I really, I have a lot of stuff that I want to talk about. Um, I mean, Tom Verlaine. So you know, I have been a, a big fan of television for as long as I've had like consciousness of that like era of punk music in New York City. You you could call him a one album wonder if you were being very uncharitable. I love a lot of his solo stuff, and I love the second and even the third television albums. But really, there's this one towering achievement of his, Marquee Moon. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm sure you, you, you got to know them probably after that, right? Oh, no, no, no. I was helping out with Marquee Moon. Like that was right. You know, I was around when they were building CBGB, you know, when they were actually putting in the planks and putting in the floorboards and actually making that. So I introduced Tom Verlaine to Richard Hell, you know, like they met at school, but I made sure that that happened, you know, like they Wait, suggested they met at a game. School. They but you made cool. sure, okay, and and so you were there while they were. So you have like construction stories of, of CBGBs. You weren't just there in the beginning, but you like like when they installed that that infamous lone toilet in the back. Were you there for that? Yeah, I told them not to pick that toilet. It's a bad toilet. They need to pick a better toilet. But yeah, getting them together was you know it's pretty easy to get two dudes to play a game of two square. You know. And then from that, they just kind of were like an awkward, an awkward dude. And then, um, you know, Tom Verlaine is an awkward, angry dude. And then Richard Hell, you might know the story already, um, but no. they, okay. So right, Richard Hell, actually, <laughs> he had like a ripped up shirt. And then he walked over to Verlaine and he just like ripped his shirt in three different places. And one part he, he ripped it in was a nipple so that a nipple was hanging out. And then he said, now you look right. He said he ripped open Richard Hell's shirt to expose Richard Hell's nipple and then said, now you no, look right. No, just in the nipple part. Right. And he said, now you look right. That's, right. And from there. I mean, that's a great Tom Verlaine quote that I wasn't even aware existed. Now you look right. Yeah. <laughs> so Marky Moon came along. I, I know that Richard Hell was kicked out of the band. Maybe you have some insight into that. Or maybe it's one of those things that it's still a little bit too raw to talk about. I don't know. Richard Hill actually like recorded some of the vocals and then they kind of just cut, cut him out of that. Um, but I think what we, you know, what we should focus on, I guess, because it's, it is the in memoriam 
is sort of uh, that Verlaine was such an amazing guitarist and that he was recognized in his time of being like so amazing. And, you know, he went through a long period of learning how to really get that guitar sound that he wanted, you know? Very distinctive guitar sound. Yeah. Very influential. He didn't really do blues licks, not a lot of string bends. It was a very kind of clean and technical sounding. Yeah. And he started out with a sound that was kind of like, um, you know, he would kind of wrap actually both hands around the neck of the guitar and it was called Choke the Monkey. And so when he was just starting to develop his sound, he would actually like Choke the Monkey. And um, it sounds crazy. Like it's really a weird, um, not nice sound. No. And that's what he was, that's what he was basing his sound around in the early days? Yeah, but it was really early. Like he smoothed it out and kind of jangled it out, you know, like kind of like, I mean, Patty Smith called it like a thousand, a thousand birds or something like that. Right. Yes. Yeah, very eloquent. <laughs> it was, but it was more like, you know, just him working it out. Like he really, figured out this bizarre way to play well, let me and, ask you something um, oh sorry, me, sorry, sorry sorry yeah no 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 go ahead oh sorry i i let, i mean patty smith uh she, she was around then she you know famously dated tom verlaine you and patty smith both you know very headstrong you know personalities i'm wondering if if you got along or if you ever clash uh, what was what was your experience with her you know, I was all right with her. She's she's very headstrong. Um, she's just a funny person who puts together words that are, you know, very can be very romantic or can be very I don't know. This is this is one that I found was that she said he's blessed with long veined hands reminiscent of the great poet stranger Jack the Ripper. <laughs> wow. She's comparing his hands to how does she know what Jack the Ripper's hands look like, first of all? Yeah, that was very so I didn't like the murderer aspect of that quote very much and then i started thinking about like what would what would patty smith's um playgirl magazine look like <laughs> if she was to edit playgirl magazine what would that even be like <laughs> and what would the pictures be like inside yeah she has a talent for words that are very they're so erotic that they almost douse any kind of <laughs> romance I don't, she, she could overdo it sometimes um, I don't know if you found that to be true, if that's just me. I find that she just, uh, I really like her a lot, but I find that everything sounds like a memory, even like ordering from a menu always sounds like kind of a distant, foggy memory of of uh, <laughs> yesteryear when it's just like fries. Yeah, you know she's, there's mean? a lot of much poetry in everything she says and does. Um, well, so they you were there for Marky Moon, you were the, I mean, I know that Brian Eno was the original producer who was brought in. Was that did that pose problems for you, or were you not involved at that point? No, I was involved. Usually, they just come. They asked me to come in and do more. You know, do a little bit more than what was happening. So that was fine. And a lot of times, I'm uncredited, so that worked out great. I mean, I he, sometimes he knows I'm working with him, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you're not even, is the band even aware that you're there? <laughs> yeah, definitely okay. the band is inviting me in. I'm not doing it without their permission. Good. Well, I want good, good, because that clears some things up. I, I was thinking maybe you producing these bands was something that was known only to you for a second. <laughs> that, that would be, <laughs> that would ex both explain things, but also I, I don't want to think that. Be ethically bad. Yeah. So he was maybe sometimes aware that you were in the room, but sometimes, I mean, that makes sense. Brian, you know, kind of a self-absorbed guy, you know, a real creative dynamo. He might get just kind of swept up in the, the, the moment in the studio and not even be aware that there's someone else there who's mainly who's producing the album. But I know that the band wasn't happy with Brian Eno's versions of the songs. And so I imagine that that's probably when, you know, you got um, got a promotion. Yeah, I I said that they should experiment more with. Uh, I was like, why not make it longer? Let's make it ten minutes. You know, like let's let's go longer. That was you. Yeah, that's how they became ten minutes, seventeen minutes live. You know, one time there was like a half an hour one, but that was too long. I would say that that is truly a jam band. So you were trying to keep them on the correct side of like jam band or not jam band. If it's ten minutes, then it's just cool, like psychedelic exploration, but. 
What what is the minute mark where it becomes jam band? It's an interesting question. I would say when you're sort of ready to leave the venue, that's a jam band. Before then, it's still a song. <laughs> See, that right there is probably why the people have you in the room. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the jam band, you know, runtime. It's a dial. It's really a dial. But, you know, the thing about the the band, yeah, they, they're kind of known for their kind of long form guitar explorations. But really, like that album, people are surprised when they hear it for the first time how catchy the songs were. I mean, did you have any any hand in, in helping to shape those songs? Yeah, I um, sometimes I just ask them to find an emotion. And then I'll be like, pretend you're shocked, but then you find out you're not. Uh, what does a teapot feel like? Be lightning for a second and then don't. And then, you know, things like that, where it's sort of like only music can bring that out. You know, you can't really write it out. You no, those can are only very, like... You know, Brian Eno has a set of cards that with just little, you know, cryptic suggestions that you're supposed to use in the studio when you find yourself creatively stuck. He calls it oblique strategies. It sounds like you have some of your own oblique strategies. Could you give me more? Pretend that you're lightning and then don't is a great one. Yeah, I mean, I think you can hear that on Marky Moon. Is just definitely you know, that moments that are very goes lovely. there and then doesn't. Yeah, I will bring a macaw into the studio and I will be interpret what this macaw is thinking, and then it'll musically come out, and then we let him loose, and then everyone's running. But also, I say, don't stop playing, just run, run for your life. Wow, that's you know that's interesting. Do you mind if we switch gears? I, I love talking. I mean, that era in music and, in, in, you know, New York City in the 70s is, is great. But there was another like legend that we lost recently in very different genre, uh, Burt Bacharach. And, yeah. you know, Burt was kind of from the old school and really his heyday came before the Beatles. It, you know, he had hits going into the 80s, but you could say that uh, really, you know, his his his. his high point came, you know, in the early sixties. And, you know, I know that, uh, you're not that old. And so I'm imagining you don't have a whole lot to do with, uh, Burt Bacharach. Oh, sure. I have a ton to do with, I mean, as in, I've worked with him a lot. I would say that he was one of the people who he's very self-generated, like, you know, like hundreds, hundreds of songs and such a long career, but I did work with him a lot. I just honestly didn't understand working with him. Like I, a lot of people, I feel like I kind of get them. But Burt Bacharach, part of our relationship was me mostly saying, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, like, so that was most, mostly. And he just was like... So he wasn't a very clear communicator? Is that what you're saying? He is. It's just, it was strange to not be totally in control of somebody's vision, not not be able to uh, help help them <laughs> help them along. He was more like, he's more like, damn, I got this. I got this. He almost you know, like, just, didn't want you to be there. <laughs> so you worked with him a lot, but he he was trying to push you out of the room. I worked with him a lot. It's one of those things where we didn't we didn't see eye to eye a lot, and a lot of times it was just like I wouldn't. I don't know if I would do that, but you do it. You've got the Burt Bacharach magic. Do you know what I mean? Like obviously he's he's huge, but um, I see how some of your techniques, like maybe bringing a macaw into the room and setting it free and and letting it cause chaos, that might have rubbed a guy like Burt Bacharach the wrong way. He seemed to be like a... Um, exactly. Yeah, so it was it was maybe some of your, you know, I'm not going to say out there, more out there techniques, but I, I imagine being in the studio with Burt Bacharach would mean like a snifter of brandy or something and, you know, low lighting and just kind of a bachelor pad kind of aura. And maybe you're coming in and you're, you know, possibly bringing wildlife and... And and it just was a clash. It was, but his his overall statement to me was that he he when I said what kind of a vision do you want me to bring to this thing, and he was like, I want to make music that feels like a luncheon. But that's how nice. do you make something that sounds like a luncheon? So I think from the start I knew that. Oh, yeah, was what did he challenge. mean by that? What do you think he meant by that? I think he meant it's easy. Nothing's gonna get crazy. We're gonna go on a we're gonna go on a ride that has a rhythm like a luncheon. You know, it's sort of we're gonna sit down. Was oh, a lunch nice different time. than a lunch? Yes. He just yes, called it lunch. More leisurely. Oh, it's more leisurely. A luncheon. Yeah, yeah. A lunch is more like a bucket and a pail and a sandwich. 
This okay. Is All right. Like, this is Bird Bacharach. So it's he was, a little more, more. Right. It's uh, it's that's more cloth. Debonair. It's cloth napkins. Right. It's that type of a thing. It's did you pick up on that offended. immediately? You just knew what he was talking about when he said luncheon. I did. I just didn't know how to deliver it to him. So that became, uh, you know, sort of over over decades, sort of what we kept doing in different ways. You know. Did you ever feel like you were a tight team with him? No, I never felt like I was a tight team with him. I felt like sometimes he would um, want direction. And in the Bacharach direction, it was like sometimes the for like what's new pussycat or something. It was like, just be aggressive. You know, be more aggressive. You know, like it, it was a different type of thing where I feel like my instincts are more like Aretha Franklin. But with him, it was more like you're going to really hit into this stuff. Like... Raindrops keep falling on my head is a is ridiculous to me. It doesn't make any sense that any human would come up with that, but he did, and it is like let's work with it. Let's see what he can do. And um, so you're trying to talk him out of raindrops keep falling on my head. Yeah, and it wasn't only me. It was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It was the Sundance Kid. <laughs> the Sundance it was, Kid too. Robert Redford. The Sundance Kid too was like yeah. Robert Redford was like I don't know about this. And then, um, you know, like 40 years later, he turned around and was like, yeah, it's the right thing. But I'm still surprised. It's like the charisma of, of Burt Bacharach won out over everything, you know, just it, it's a silly song. And it, I guess it works because it's him. But that's his magic is that it was sort of like, you know, at the end of the day, let's go with what you're doing because it's working. But it was an interesting collaboration to sort of admit that I felt on the outside of the lunch and not not on the inside. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's I guess that must be strange for you because you're used to feeling like a very close collaborator with these people who you work with. Yeah, I feel like I'm for, I'm uh, fostering. <laughs> I'm fostering something with him. I felt like I'm just keeping him afloat. Well, yeah, I could talk about Burt Bacharach all day, but I mean, there are just there's so many, um, you know, legends who we've lost recently, including David Crosby. But I mean, he was oh, he has been in the public eye for a long time, not only for being a musician and, and a great musician, you know, never I, I'm, I, can't, I have to be upfront with you. I know that you probably were friends with him, right? Sure. Yeah. OK, well, then I, I I'm, I'm just going to admit that I was not a huge fan um, of his music. But uh, I, you know, I've always admired his contributions to, say, The Birds. There's an, an early solo album of his that I enjoy a lot, If I Could Only Remember My Name. You know, but mostly when I was growing up, I knew him as a figure in like the tabloids. He was always in trouble. You know, he was always swept up in some kind of, you know, cocaine bust or weapons charge. And I, I, I was I'm wondering if you knew him during that very tumultuous period in his life. And if you ever got caught up in that stuff. I did never get caught up in it, but uh, definitely um, it was sort of a whirlwind. Um, you know, it was, I, I tried to stay out of like the drug scene, but he did have a bunch of snakes in his basement and that was uh, uncomfortable. And I didn't know what to do with those because what do you do with snakes? And like, who does that? Like, why would you? Why would you? Well, so what, but you can answer, what did he do with them? Well, we finally had to call animal control and get them out. And oh, so uh, he didn't want them there. You know, there were snakes that happened to be infesting his basement. He actually wanted them there, uh, but I think it was like we knew that this was uh, not helpful to the music. You know, uh, snakes just take up your time. Yes, at the end of the day, they're true. just time sucks. That's true. <laughs> I think, are there, yeah, they're pets that need a lot of attention, and maybe he found himself like slacking off in the music department as he was finding rats for them. Right. He just wanted to name them mostly. And that, that wasn't what we had time for. We had time for music or naming snakes, not both. Were there ever any close calls with like, he had a lot of celebrity friends who would drop by. Anybody uh, run afoul of the snakes or while you were there to the best of your knowledge? Yeah. You know what? Uh, Peter Tork ran afoul of the snakes and he oh. paid the price, you know? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. That's, that's a awful. replacement nose. That's awful. Yeah. So that's unfortunate. But you know well i don't know i mean yeah there when you live that way there there are casualties and i'm i'm sad to hear that peter tork who seemed like a very gentle sort of soul was one of them well i, I don't i want to bring up the mood first i i'm sorry like i i didn't want it to get you know get bogged down in all this very heavy snake talk but um you know he he had a comeback and um 
it, it, it was really a remarkable story. And at the end of his career, this guy's turning like 80 years old and he's, um, or at least late seventies. I can't remember exactly, but he started this string of new solo albums and tours. And he seemed really creatively uh, reinvigorated. And I just wondered if you were, you know, there for any of that. I was, I was, I want to back up and just, because we were talking about Peter Tork, can I, uh, I just, a funny thing happened to at his house and I just. Yeah, please. No, I'm fascinated. He used to date Johnny Mitchell, right? Just for a little bit. And she wrote a breakup song about him and she unveiled it at Peter Tork's house. And all David Crosby knew was that she was unveiling a new song. So he was really excited. And all of the celebrity friends are sitting around, you know, with the snakes in the basement and everybody, you know, being resting, sleeping, maybe. And then she sings it and he realizes it's a breakup song. But I actually helped her write that breakup song. Really? So this was the first draft. Yeah. David Crosby, you're always on me. Hey, pretends to toss a sandwich. Go get it. I'm breaking up with you. I'm breaking up with you. Crosby, that's you. Then somebody says, one more time. And then she sings it again. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how he knew he got dumped. Wow. Well, that bears that the unmistakable stamp of Joni Mitchell's poetry. Uh, so that's, that's how she, that's kind of cold. It's super cold, but a little awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of cool too. And I'll bet you anything that David, I mean, David Crosby had it coming. Probably. Scott Jacobson is a writer and executive producer on Bob's Burgers, which is currently in its 13th season. He has also written for The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Tamara Federici is rhyming and or stealing. The producer and editor is Will Velasquez. The audio engineer is Clark Jackson. Executive producers are Carl W. Adams and Tamara Federici. Hell yes we have interns. Mary Lear and Jonah Katz. Mirror mirror on the wall tell me mirror, what is wrong? Can it be my day la clothes? Or is it just my day la soul? Find our Instagram, Patreon, Substack, Merch, and more through the link tree in the episode description.